Order members, we now move to question time. Ask questions to the Minister of Finance and Personnel. And we start with topical questions. And I call Mitchell McLaughlin. You leave this out for me. <laughs> uh, hello, Minister. Good afternoon. Uh, you're probably aware, Minister, that civil servants in uh, Waterside House in Derry uh, have been uh, distressed to learn of plans to uh, outsource their jobs and that uh, you may be making uh, a statement on this matter in the near future. Uh, could you explain just why uh, you know, this developed almost under the radar? Uh, I'm sure you weren't trying to keep it a secret. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I welcome the member to the House? <laughs> very time timely arrival, very efficient arrival to the House. Um, take, take exception with one of the, the, the terms that the member has used, that, um, that this has happened under the radar. Um, trade union staff in Waterside House and our civil servants pensions branch, which is based in Londonderry, have been consulted uh, throughout this process. Um, the, he also used the, the, the phrase in term outsourcing the work that they do. And I think this, this gives me a, a useful opportunity, as indeed will, I'm sure, uh, an adjournment debate on public sector jobs in the North West later on this evening to clarify a few points which I think have been uh, whipped up for some particular purpose by some ill-informed um, public comment on this topic. I can understand the concerns that staff in pensions branch might have whenever I would read, if I was one of them and I was reading some of the comments, that 80 jobs in their branch could be made redundant because of uh, the outsourcing of the work that they do. Let me make it clear to the member, let me make it clear to the House that the work that we are doing in terms of a future uh, delivery project, service delivery project, comes out of necessity. The IT systems that we have that pay and administer pensions are running two separate IT systems at the minute and they are coming to the end of their life. And whilst it's not a, a determinative factor, it is an issue where pension reform across the water is necessitating that we streamline what we do. So we are having to procure one new uh, uh, IT system to pay and administer pensions. Um, I am duty bound, I believe, to um, provide the best service that I possibly can for everybody in Northern Ireland and do so in a value for money way. And I think I would be remiss in my duties, and the member would perhaps be the first to attack me if, in seeking solutions for the future delivery of pensions in Northern Ireland, I did not look at all options that were there including outsourcing, if indeed that prov provides the best value for money and indeed the best service and the best outcomes. Mr McLaughlin. And, uh, I thank the, uh, the Minister and I assure him, while I might criticise him, I will not attack him. Uh, he and I have uh, done some useful work over the years on the Finance Committee. I have to say it came as a bit of a surprise to members of the Finance Committee. Uh, I have spoken to uh, some of those very civil servants in Derry, and it's, they, it's not somebody whipping it up who are seriously concerned. Can the Minister indicate if outsourcing is one of the options that uh, is in this mix, will it affect the wider civil service as well as an option? I, I have no, let, me, let me make this point. I have no ideological problem with any form of service delivery model, whether that be doing it in-house, uh, a joint venture with the private sector, outsourcing it to perhaps the private sector or the third sector, the voluntary and community sector. I have no sort of dogma that drives me in one particular way or in the other. The only ideology and the only dogma that drives me in respect of this, Mr Speaker, is getting the best service that provides the best outcome for the people who elect us to serve them. Uh, in respect of the staff in Waterside House, I can understand the concerns that they would have, but let me make, let me make this clear, that they have been informed uh, throughout this process that because of the necessity to produce a new IT system, there will be a requirement to have less staff. No matter what option is chosen, there will be a requirement to have less staff in Waterside House. But let me make this clear as well, that no matter what outcome is chosen, no matter what the uh, outlined business case uh, suggests, the direction in which we head in this matter, um, there will still be a necessity for a pensions branch, because there will be you know, high-level work, particularly in terms of policy, in terms of financial accounting and other areas, which will still be required, and those people will be civil servants. Anybody, and there will be some people who will not be required uh, in pensions branch in the future, they will not be made redundant, and they will be moved around the systems in a, system in accordance with uh, custom and practice uh, within the civil service. So those who are, Mr Speaker, publicly saying that 80 
civil servants will be made redundant are wrong in their numbers, and they are wrong even to say that those people will be made redundant. And I hope that I can give today and perhaps later in the debate some assurance to those people that the concerns that have been whipped up by some public comment are not valid. Can I ask the Minister if his department has any plans to increase the number of staff using more sustainable transport? And I'm thinking really about the amount of money that is spent on car parking spaces in the Belfast area for staff each year by executive departments. I appreciate that there is a, a desire right across society to try to be more sustainable and more environmentally friendly in our use of transport. I think by necessity the civil service, particularly uh, my department is in, its, in its stewardship of, of all properties across the civil service, will have um, a number of properties that have car parking spaces with it, but he will be aware of many schemes that we uh, run within the civil service, including uh, cycle to work schemes and, and, and um, car sharing initiatives that the Minister for Regional Development will be responsible, responsible for that uh, encourage civil servants, public servants right across the board to be uh, more considerate about the use of transport, the, the, the choice of transport and mode of transport that they would choose to use. Um, but we have to accept in some cases, in many cases in fact, uh, using motor vehicles to get to their place of work is the best and only option available to people. Barry Mr. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker. Can I suggest to the Minister that if we had a very serious approach to decentralisation of public sector jobs to towns like Oma, that uh, that is one way of reducing such costs and such numbers of car parking spaces? And really, what I am asking the Minister is are we serious? about relocation of public sector jobs, decentralisation, or are we merely paying lip service to it? Well, the, the member will be, will be well aware that his uh, party colleague, the Minister of Agriculture, does intend to decentralise headquarters jobs from the Department of Agriculture to Ballykelly. I think that would be something that I am sure that the member would welcome. Um, the town of Oma, which he is obviously very fond of, given that he lives there and represents it, does have one of the highest levels per 1,000 or per 100,000 of the working population uh, of people working within the public sector. Uh, so in that respect, there has been uh, decentralisations of jobs to that area. I don't accept, though, that the argument that if we were to take all of our government departments and put them all out to provincial towns, that suddenly we would see the end of people driving into work. My experience in Northern Ireland is that people will drive even very, very short distances to work. So in that respect, there will still be a need for car parking spaces, whether the headquarters or the agency is, the, is in Oma or in Belfast or Newton Ards or wherever it might be. Alwyn McGuinness. Mr. McGuinness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, um, uh, last week, um, the RBS announced a review into the Ulster Bank and its operations here in Northern Ireland, the RBS being the parent bank and also being state-owned. Uh, has the Minister any concerns in relation to that review, and has the Minister sought a meeting with RBS to discuss the review? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for, for his question. Um, it is a, I think I would have been more concerned at the outcome uh, of the announcement had it have been the decision that had been taken by the government in conjunction with RBS had have been one of those options that were very publicly being talked about, which was something along the lines of, of Ulster Bank, which we know to, to have been a, a serious problem within the RBS group and for the RBS group, and indeed much of the detail contained behind the report. Um, does show the extent to which Ulster Bank is a problem within the group. I think we would have been more worrying today, and more, uh, had more cause to be concerned today, if the option of creating the Ulster Bank and hiving the Ulster Bank off and all of its assets, whether good or bad, and establishing it as a bad bank either internally within the group or outside of the group, I think we would have had more concern to be worried then. So in that respect, I welcome the fact that a decision has been taken by the Treasury to retain the Ulster Bank as a core part of RBS's operations. And I think given, as the member has acknowledged, the, the fact that it is our biggest lending bank, it is over 30 per cent of the market, it, it is the only sort of nationally owned bank and therefore is very often the only bank that takes forward national, le national lending initiatives like funding for lending in Northern Ireland and export finance guarantee scheme in Northern Ireland, it's essential that we have an Ulster Bank here that is functioning properly. Uh, that has been recognised by Treasury. Do I have concerns? Absolutely. There are, there are areas in the report that do cause concern. The review, the second review into uh, establishing the Ulster Bank on a long-term and sustainable footing, 
I, I think is, is code for further restructuring of that bank. I think it is probably inevitable that there will be further job losses, Mr Speaker, in respect of Ulster Bank, as indeed there probably will be across other banks before they get to the position where they are properly functioning. And I have also some concerns uh, at the time scale for the sale of assets of three years, um, which, as a member will know, in, in a depressed property market like the one in Northern Ireland we, that we have currently, is cause for concern. Alwyn McGuinness. Um, could I thank the Minister for that answer? And I'm banking uh, the first part of uh, his answer. Uh, it is reassuring uh, in relation to the Treasury's view and RBS's view in relation to the Ulster Bank. However, when I hear the term review, particularly coming from banks, I think I, I am right to be nervous, given the fact that over the past number of years the banks have butchered uh, branches and staff. And, uh, therefore, I would ask the Minister to have direct contact with RBS and to say to RBS, to finish. Say to RBS no more uh, branch cuts and no more staff cuts. Uh, thank the member again for summary. I, I was remiss in not uh, addressing the issue of have I met with Ulster Bank. I have spoken with senior management in Ulster Bank. Uh, I am scheduled to meet them next week. Um, following on from that meeting, I would hope to meet with uh, the new chief executive, Ross McEwen, uh, the new chief executive of RBS, uh, because I do think there are points, like the, the points that the member has made, that we need to reiterate and the, the importance of, and I think that the, the, the report gives us that argument to take to RBS and to take to Treasury, that there is an acknowledgement of the importance of Ulster Bank to the Northern Ireland economy. We need the Ulster Bank to be functioning properly because, as a member will know and the House will know, businesses are starting to see signs of recovery, and if they are starting to see signs of recovery, they will be wanting to get the sort of credit that they need to develop their businesses. So in that respect, we need the Ulster Bank to be doing its job, which is lending money to have people who have viable propositions. Um, so I hope to, hope to meet with the Treasury. I hope that we have already spoken to the Treasury again on the telephone. Um, the Joint Ministerial Task Force, which Arlene Foster and I sit on, will, I am sure, concentrate and drill down on this particular issue. In meeting with Ulster Bank as well, I hope to, to, to um, try to influence as best I can this new, new bad bank creation that Northern Ireland's property market isn't the same as London and the South East, um, flooding our market with uh, assets over a very short three-year period, distinct, of course, from what NAMA are doing, which is taking a much longer view to distressed assets. Doing that over three years could have a very seriously detrimental impact on a property market which is languishing close to the bottom, but is at least showing some, early, some, some signs of some improvement. We don't want to kill that stone dead uh, before it has even started. Prime McCann, Mr. McCann. Well, Amila Malgat, Kian Kolya, Kest, Ever Kahar, question four. Order it. It's, it's topical questions. Sorry. Just ask the question directly to the Minister. Well, as, uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate uh, Simon on his recent promotion uh, to, to the Minister. Uh, but the, the, uh, say the, there, there has been no doubt there will be serious problems uh, with the recent announcement on APD uh, in the South. Uh, could the Minister uh, tell us uh, what, what, what he is doing uh, as a Minister to try and uh, deal with the, pro the serious problem that that could cause in the North? Uh, I thank the Member, Mr. Speaker, for his question. I thank him for his, his congratulations as well. Um, the, the announcement within the uh, Republic of Ireland's budget that they would eliminate APD has obviously brought this issue to the forefront of people's minds once again. In itself, I don't think the reduction, the elimination rather, of APD from three euros down to zero will have a massively significant effect on traffic from Northern Ireland's airports down to Dublin Airport. And in fact, that was reflected in public comments made by um, Belfast City Airport after the Irish Government's uh, budget announcement. Um, and I think that's, I think that's fairly transparently why it would be the case that you know, three, saving three euros on a flight isn't enough of a justification to pay for the petrol and the toll and so forth to go on the parking um, to go down to Dublin Airport. But I do accept that there is a problem caused and a distortion caused within Northern Ireland by having APD. It is a, a tax that is, is the very definition of an unfair tax because it, it works against regional, regions of the United Kingdom, like Northern Ireland, like Scotland, like some parts of Northern England as well. And in that respect, I would, and I'm sure the member would, would echo my concerns 
and would say to Treasury that it is time that it eliminated APD so that we could have a fair tax situation in Northern Ireland and we could uh, use the elimination of it for all flights, as we've already done for, for long-haul flights ourselves, to encourage more people to operate, more, more airlines to operate out of Northern Ireland and increase and enhance our, our connectivity to the world. Order member, that concludes topical questions to the Minister of Finance. We now move to all questions to the Minister, and I call Barry McElduff. Uh, Mr. McElduff. Have I got uh, cash ever again? Question number one. I thought, I thought we got rid of you earlier. Um, the ongoing revaluation exercise involves the interpretation of open market rental evidence, and this will dictate the new rateable values that my department will publish by the end of next year. The legislation requires that businesses and town centres are treated in exactly the same way as businesses elsewhere, and therefore land and property services cannot give special consideration to any location or sector of business. The valuation process is entirely evidence-based, and naturally that rental evidence reflects the relative advantages and disadvantages of particular trading locations. At the end of the day, it is the open market that establishes current rent levels and thus their new rateable values as well. This alone will determine who pays more and who pays less following the revaluation. Questions number 2, 11 and 13 have all been withdrawn. Barry McElduff. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Um, thank the Minister for his answer, which was perhaps quite rigid, you know, and uh, didn't suggest much flexibility. But uh, I would like to think that the Minister would be a listening Minister in respect of businesses under pressure, uh, rising energy costs and rates are often quoted. Could I ask the Minister directly if he would agree to meet with, either here in Stormont or in Oma, a representative grouping of town centre businesses from that area to hear at first hand their concerns about rates? In, in respect, Mr Speaker, of meeting with any group of traders, I'm more than happy to do that. I'm more than happy to meet with traders from, from Oma. Indeed, I've met with, since assuming office three months ago, I've met with traders from Balamina, Balamoney, from uh, Belfast uh, and everywhere. Um, so I'm more than happy to do that. I am in that regard a listening minister. In terms of what I am able to do for those people, that is perhaps a little bit more limited. Although I would point out to the member, Mr Speaker, the, the raft of initiatives that predecessors in this post have brought forward to try to assist the very sorts of businesses that the member is talking about. So the likes of small business um, uh, rates relief has been a great assistance to businesses right across Northern Ireland. Wherever I travel, I hear businesses telling me how important that, that has been to them. It has ensured that they have remained in business in some cases. It has ensured that they have retained some staff in some cases. And, and I, don't think, I think we would be in a far worse. And I accept entirely that many town centres across Northern Ireland, many high streets, there are problems and there are difficulties, and I think some of those are going to continue to be, in, be the case. But I think we would have been in a far worse position if it had not been for something like Small Business Rates Relief Scheme, which has given £1.5 million in relief to properties in OMA. And of course, his constituency does extend beyond OMA, in case I need to tell him that. And, and uh, Straban District Council area has seen almost £1 million in relief through the Small Business Rates Relief Scheme. And, and, and this department has also um, frozen the non domestic regional rate. I think we're into the eight, eighth year of that freeze. And of course, we've introduced empty properties relief uh, to tackle vacancies which are dotted right across towns and city centres across Northern Ireland. And again, the West Tyrone constituency, Mr. Speaker, has benefited from seeing eight new businesses in Oma and Straban benefiting from that 50% rates concession. Dominic Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Could I ask the, the Minister, he mentioned there in his response the small business rates relief scheme, and that is a time limited scheme, as far as I remember, governed by a sunset clause. Uh, will the Minister consider extending that scheme at the end of its uh, present uh, period? Thank the member for his question, Mr. Speaker. I, I, I am very fond of the Small Business Rates Relief Scheme, as I mentioned to Mr. Michael Duff in response to his question. I think that it has done a lot of positive things for small businesses right across Northern Ireland, and it has been recognised by this House, which has approved not just one but actually two extensions of the Small Business Rates Relief Scheme. To the extent now, where, Mr. Mr. Speaker, uh, over half of all business properties in Northern Ireland receive at least 20 per cent of their rates bill, uh, and it is a um, when you compare it to other. Um, Systems across uh, other reliefs, similar reliefs across the United Kingdom, it is an exceptionally um, extensive and um, 
positive scheme. Um, I think that in terms of extending it beyond, and he's right that it is time limited, um, I will be conducting a, a re-evaluation of the scheme next year, and I want to do that after the revaluation has reported its initial findings to see what impact ha the revaluation has had, because the, the Small Business Registry Scheme was brought in in part in an acknowledgement that we hadn't had a revaluation for a number of years and that there was some potential distortions within the market. If those distortions are ironed out by the revaluation, then the necessity for a Small Business Rates Relief Scheme may be eliminated, but if it hasn't been, I'm certainly not adverse. Resources depending, of course, to reintroducing something similar to what we already have. Paul Gerber. Mr. Gerber. Thank the Minister for his answer uh, so far. Uh, but in relation to the 2015 um, sunset clause, as has been alluded to, uh, the extension, if a further extension were to be looked at, would there be any possibility that the uh, rate valuation figure could be increased? Uh, I appreciate it started off at five thousand, went up to ten thousand uh, pounds rate, rateable value uh, to be included. But we understand there is still a small number uh, require uh, some uh, assistance as well. Yeah, I, I'm, I, th I think it's, as this scheme, which has been a very successful scheme, as I said, comes toward the end of its of its life. Um, I think there will be an increasing uh, conversation about what we do beyond 2015. And as I said to, to Mr Bradley, I'm not against having a small business rates relief scheme, but there must be a need for it. And we must also see that the scheme that we have had has had the, uh, the extent of the positive benefits that it has had. And I believe that it has had positive benefits, and I'm, I'm sure the member from, from his own constituency could report back many traders, many businesses who have benefited from the scheme. So, you know, it's not that I'm against doing it, but I want to see evidence that it has worked, and I want to see through the results of the revaluation, Mr. Speaker, that there is indeed a need for it. Because if we have seen, as some might anticipate, a correction and a, and a move and a shift in the balance of where rates are payable to, say, edge of town or out of town, shopping centres or complexes, that might be then be to the benefit of uh, small businesses in town and city centres, and therefore there may not be a need for a relief scheme to, or, at all or to the extent of the one that we have had. But it, his question does allow me once again to reiterate to, to people who I think expect, because their rents have gone down, that automatically their rates are going to go down uh, as a result of the revaluation. As the member will know, that isn't always necessarily the case, and it is a, an average rate across Northern Ireland that determines whether it goes down or doesn't go down. But I await the results of the revaluation and then the evaluation of the Small Business Rates Relief the Scheme to decide what we do beyond 2015. Danny Callaghan. Mr Speaker, I thank the Minister for his answer and certainly welcome any of the rates relief schemes, but rates are always going to be painful. Is the Minister thinking outside the box? Is he working with the Treasury to think of completely new ways for how we finance our councils? Yeah, no one likes to pay rates. I think uh, ourselves and every member in this House, I don't think, likes to pay their rates. And the members are declaring a personal interest there. Um, um, I wouldn't like to be paying his rateable value, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Although it is, well, it is a lovely house, though. Castle? Yeah. Uh, castle. I don't sure. House, castle, uh, stately home. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether. I'm, I'm not sure whether. I'm not sure. House, castle, stately home. I'm not sure if that shows up on the rates bill or not, but it is, it is, it is a lovely property nonetheless. Um, it, it, the member is, is, is right to identify a, a longer-term problem that we have. Well, it's not, it's not even a longer-term problem because we're starting to see the effect of it now. Retail probably pays, if you take retail alone, probably pays a, a, a higher than proportionate amount in terms of its contribution to the economy in its rates bills. Uh, and as we all know, it doesn't matter what part of Northern Ireland you go to, town centres are under pressure. They're under pressure from changes in lifestyle, changes in shopping trends are under pressure as well from the fact that all of us are now using more and more <laughs> online to go and shop. Uh, and obviously, if you have a shop and you have bricks and mortar, that is a cost not just in maintaining that and keeping that and paying for that, but also in your rates bill. He is right to identify that Treasury perhaps have a role and responsibility in this because one of the mooted suggestions is that we move to, towards a more uh, something where you um, put a tax on online uh, transactions. What money we would get that from that as an administration would be something that I would be interested to see. Um, I think by the end of this revaluation, we will it will be close to 10 years since we in Northern Ireland have looked at our non-domestic taxation system. And I think it would be a timely opportunity then, given those other changes, given the moment that it is, to once again look at the options that there might be to amend or change our own non-domestic taxation system. But in saying that, 
and looking at it, and without pre prejudicing that review, I am not entirely sure what system we should move to and whether there are any systems that are available that would be massively better than what is a, in rates a fairly understandable and easy to implement system. Um, but I am happy to look at any and all options that there might be, and I think once we get through the revaluation, re that might be a timely moment to do that. Can I just remind the Minister of the two minute rule? <laughs> Keir McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Continuing on the theme of rates, question number three. I'm tempted to refer the member to the answer I gave some moments ago, but there, there are a range of rate reliefs available uh, which can apply in town centres. Small business rate relief scheme is, is now awarded to almost uh, 25,000 business premises that get at least 20% rate relief. The empty shops rate concession introduced by my predecessor in April of 2012 has been extended until 2015. More than 170 new businesses across Northern Ireland have now received a 50% first year discount. So far as empty properties are concerned, owner, owners benefit from a 50% reduction in rates, unlike the position in the rest of the United Kingdom. Another unique measure is specifically targeted at improving the appearance of town centres. It allows the use of window displays in empty shops for non-commercial purposes without triggering the full occupied rate. Ian McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for his response. Um, given the, the plight of the, the town centres, um, Throughout Northern Ireland, has the Minister made any assessment of making it easier for owners uh, to convert empty shops that have been lying for some time um, into other users for other uses, uh, thereby reducing the, the amount of rates that would be demanded of those the new uses? Thank you, Member, for, for his question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I think whenever I uh, in the town centres that I have visited in the chambers of commerce that I have met already, one of the things that you get back uh, frequently from them is their belief that in the future our town centres can't be so dominated and so led in terms of development by retail um, because of uh, what I said in response to Mr Kinnan that our habits and our, and our, our, our behaviour in terms of retail is changing and therefore town centres need to change and they need to become much more commercial and, and more office space. Uh, they certainly need to have more residential space in them, uh, and they need to have probably a lot more cultural space and leisure space as well. So our town centres, I think, if they're going to survive and if they're going to thrive, need to be different town centres than the ones that we entered the downturn with. And indeed, many traders will, will openly admit to you that you know, there was far too many shops in their town centres, and whilst we were going through boom times and there was a lot of money about, some of those shops might have been sustainable, but it was a false sustainability in the longer term, and unfortunately we have seen that in many town centres across Northern Ireland. In terms of converting uh, premises, retail premises into other use, obviously there is a, a planning element in that in terms of change of use, which you should take up with the Minister of the Environment. I would be very keen to see much more residential use, or particularly the space above shops, and there was a, a good scheme uh, run by the Department of Social Development a number of years ago, uh, something like that. It's something perhaps you could take up with the Department for Social Development. I think is, it would be resources permitting a good scheme to diversify our town centres. But I would again point the member, Mr. Speaker, to what we have already done in terms of empty property relief to, to get empty vacant retail units back into use. And in our own Ards uh, Borough Council area, some seven shops have availed of £15,000 worth of relief in their first year of operation. And whilst that's only seven, and he and I both know that there are many more vacant units than seven across the area, it is at least a start. Adrian McQuillan. Mr McQuillan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for his answer so far? Minister, how does our non-domestic rating system compare with the rest of the UK? I, I, think, I like to think it, it compares favourably. I mean, I, I wouldn't for a second stand um, in front of this House and say that we have by far the best non-domestic rating system in, in Northern Ireland. I think the, the nature of, of the evolution is that different uh, devolved regions and administrations will choose what they think is the best thing for their own particular area. But I think we do uh, compare exceptionally favourably to what happens in the rest of the, of, of the United Kingdom. I want to take two examples. One is the, um, the relief, the 50% relief that we do give to empty premises, and I'm not talking about those that are occupied in the first year. Although, in, in saying that, our, our empty property relief has now been replicated in both Scotland and in Wales. So, you know, sometimes we are in the vanguard and are doing things that are innovative in Northern Ireland that others copy. But the relief that an empty property gets in Northern Ireland is 50 per cent. That compares exceptionally favourably to England and Wales, where ratepayers pay 100 per cent, and in Scotland, where they pay 90 per cent. In terms of the uh, business rate system as well, another positive that we have in Northern Ireland is that 
um, increases in GB are determined through the September RPI figures, not for this year was 3.2 per cent. In Northern Ireland, we set the increase um, for the regional rate part of our bill using the lowest inflationary measure that there is, that's the GDP deflator. And for this, this year, and indeed for next, that's set at 2.7. So where rates rise, where the regional rates rise, it is a lower rise here in Northern Ireland than it is elsewhere. But I wouldn't stand and argue that we have by far the best, but I think we have, a, um, we have shown by our innovation within this department that we are prepared to listen and to respond to the problems that, we are there, that are there. And as a result, then, we have a very favourable and very comparable uh, non-domestic rating system in Northern Ireland. Alec Baskey. Uh, Gormley, I got Con Kula, could I thank the Minister for his responses so far? Could I ask the Minister that uh, given the, uh, the fact that in Belfast City Centre, for, for example, uh, uh, along with all of the other pressures that have been addressed here this morning, we had a, a quite an extended period of disruptive protests, and would the Minister accept and promote the fact that, that what we need to have this incoming year, pre Christmas especially, is to have uh, the, a city centre free from such uh, disruptive protests? Well, I don't wish to get into a situation as to who caused and who started it all. I don't think that would get any of us anywhere. Um, and he, I'm sure, would join with me in protecting and defending anyone's right to protest in Northern Ireland. Um, there are plenty of people in this House who down through the years protested on a lot of things. Um, but I would agree to the extent that I don't think anybody uh, wants to see our city centre or indeed any part of Northern Ireland uh, crippled over what will be in a very important Christmas period, a very important trading period over Christmas, yeah. by any of the scenes, re repeats of any of the scenes of violence that we saw last year. I absolutely defend and protect the right of anybody to protest, but it must be done in a lawful and in a peaceful way. Uh, Jim Allister. Mr. Allister. The Minister may be aware of the news today that the town of Balamina, according to a survey, has now in the enviable position of having the highest proportion of empty shops right across Northern Ireland, at a staggering 27 per cent of all shops being empty. What can the Minister do to address that? I appreciate he can't rig the rating system, but he can do more, surely, if the present concessions are not arresting the decline. And is his mind open to doing more in terms of relief for town centre shops so that we can arrest this situation in a prosperous town hitherto like Palomino. Yeah, I thank the member, Mr Speaker, for his comments. And, and I, I would agree with I can remember many years whenever in my childhood being taken up to Palomino by my parents. It was a vibrant and very dynamic shopping town. I think in terms of a case study across Northern Ireland where we can very visibly see changes in shopping trends and shopping behaviour and the impact of edge and out-of-town retail, I think Ballymena would be one of the first that would spring to mind. I was in Ballymena a couple of weeks ago. I met with the mayor. I met with uh, several councillors. I met with the Chamber of Commerce. And I was surprised somewhat by, whilst I don't deny that there are a large number of vacancies in Ballymena Town Centre, I've seen them for myself, um, there, the message that is coming forward as a result of the publication of the report today doesn't chime with what I heard from, from many retailers in Ballymena who accept that their town is under pressure, accept that there are a number of vacancies within their town centre, but they are reporting to me that they are seeing through many initiatives that the Council is leading, trade actually starting to go up, in particularly in and around the town centre. I understand that this report isn't just about the town centre, I think it takes in peripheral areas in the town as well, and that will, as a member will know, sometimes distort uh, the figures and, and make them look far, far worse than they are. Um, in terms of what assistance and what support we as an executive can give to Ballymena. I mean, it's not just Ballymena, it's right across Northern Ireland, but to highlight what we have already done in Ballymena. In terms of small business rates relief scheme, um, 1,183 properties have got £1.7 million worth of relief on their rates build. Uh, in terms of empty properties and trying to address some of those vacancies, um, Ballymena was slow to start. Which I think is whenever there was some there was free money on the go, I think it's a very uncharacteristic of the Ballymena area. But there are now four new premises open in Ballymena, uh, availing of £11,000 worth of relief in the first year of their operation. Now, I don't think I, I accept that you know there are probably other things that we could do, but I operate within a very defined spending envelope, um, and there is no matter how many. Um, things that I could do, if, even if I eliminated the rates for some businesses, having no rates bills at all is no substitute for not having sufficient turnover. If you do not have a viable business, if you do not have turnover, which is enough to keep you above water, then there is nothing that I or anybody can do with the rates bill to keep them in operation. Cattle Boylan. 
Mr. Boyle. Kesht Ebra Gahar, Nedahal. Question number four, please. Thank you, Member, for his question. Mr. Speaker, the AFP is currently undertaking a scoping exercise to examine the Scottish Calman and Welsh Silk Commission reports and the positions taken in respect of the possible devolution of each individual tax or duty on those. After that, a work programme will be developed to progress this exercise in order to put recommendations on the possible devolution of additional fiscal powers to the Executive by autumn 2014, in line with the commitment in the Building a Prosperous and United Community document. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and the Minister for his answer. But could I ask the Minister if there are any plans to involve external experts' opinion in the review? There, there aren't any specific plans at this stage, but you know, there, there, is a, uh, there are a number of people who have already come forward with uh, opinion and thinking of, you know, the, particularly recently, the NICFA report, which looked at additional tax raising powers that the, the Stormont Assembly may, may wish to take upon itself. Um, so, you know, in terms of listening to outside voices, to involving those and giving some evidence to any room, I'm not against that by any means. Um, but ultimately, uh, as a member will appreciate, Mr. Speaker, it is a final decision rests with ourselves in this assembly whether we want to take the powers on ourselves or upon ourselves or not. Uh, William Humphrey, Mr. Humphrey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the minister for his uh, answer so far. Can I ask the minister if he's pressing uh, the national government at Westminster for Northern Ireland to be treated the same as Scotland and Wales? Well, I, I, I think that the nature of the devolutionary settlement is that. We will all want to be treated in slightly different ways, depending on what our particular uh, objectives are uh, as a region. Uh, we have so far pursued, in terms of tax devolution, uh, those powers which would be of economic advantage to Northern Ireland. So we are continuing to pursue <laughs> corporation tax, and work is ongoing in respect of ensuring that, you know, should a positive decision be taken by the Prime Minister next autumn, that we are ready to devolve those powers as quickly as possible. And obviously the Member and, and, and the House will know that the, um, the positive economic benefits that being able to reduce our corporation tax rate would, would bring for Northern Ireland. The other power that we have already devolved is our passenger duty for direct long-haul flights. And whilst that wasn't a tax, we didn't pursue that as a tax per se to devolve for Northern Ireland. It was the solution to a problem that we had, which brought an economic benefit for Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland in terms of retaining that direct connection between Belfast and, and New York. The, the approach adopted by other regions like Scotland and Wales has been much more dominated by uh, I have to say probably more by politics in terms of trying to increase fiscal accountability within those regions and particularly aggressively pursued in, in Scotland by the government there for, for, I think, probably more political reasons than we would have here. Um, I think different regions will want to be treated in different ways for, for particularly different reasons. I think we have always got to be mindful, though, in pursuing tax devolution. I am not against devolving more taxes to Northern Ireland if there is a defined benefit for Northern Ireland as a just, uh, for devolving those tax uh, powers to Northern Ireland, that in doing so we always need to be mindful of the gap that it might cause in terms of the revenues that we receive as an executive and our ability, therefore, and from that to spend on providing services to the people who elect us. Judith Cotton. Mr. Cotton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers this, thus far. Does the Minister believe that we in Northern Ireland um, can learn any lessons um, from the recent Calman Silk Commissions in Scotland and Wales, respectively? And is there any danger um, that they could now outflank Northern Ireland on tax varying powers? Thank the, the member for, for her question, Mr. Speaker. I, I don't think there is any risk of us being outflanked again for the, for the reasons that I uh, said to Mr. Mr. Humphrey. That I think different regions will want to choose different powers. Uh, depending on what their own particular interests are. Uh, in some ways, what, what has come out as uh, a result of the, the announcement in the last week in Wales, following on from the Silk Commission, is Wales, in some respects, actually just catching up with where we are. So the biggest thing they got was borrowing powers, which we have already had for the last number of years and have maximised over the last decade or so, in, in terms of the, so, so we can deliver more capital infrastructure in Northern Ireland. Um, if you look at the types of powers that are available from Treasury, and there is a, some uh, frequent demand to have, let's devolve more powers, but it may not always be a case that Treasury would want to give you those powers, and it would appear from both Silk and from Calman that the only power, and, and, and the response that comes from Treasury, the only powers that are on offer are land-based powers, so things like stamp duty and things like um, uh, so, you know, stamp, stamp duty in particular and landfill tax. 
uh, which are things that cannot then be easily moved across, across boundaries. So I don't fear um, that we are going to be outflanked or we're going to fall behind other regions. I think we are, in many respects, particularly including, including APD, well ahead of other regions and, and long haul. Uh, the ability to adjust APD for long haul direct flights is something that the Welsh and Scottish finance ministers look on quite coveted um, and covet what we have. Thank you, Member, for his question. I met with NAMA's Chairman Frank Daly and the Northern Ireland Advisory Committee on the 7th of October as part of my regular engagement um, with the agency and indeed other banks. We discussed a broad range of issues uh, around NAMA's management of its Northern Ireland assets, including the importance of ensuring that they are released at a suitable time without having a negative impact on the market that is beginning to show some first signs of recovery here. Uh, the committee assured me that their approach is to encourage a phased and orderly realisation of assets while seeking to avoid saturating the market with additional unwanted supply. Could I ask the Minister um, how he could ensure that the northern assets of NAMA be uh, redirected and indeed how the NAMA committee uh, would be stepped in terms of efficiency and accountability? In terms of I take the points in, in reverse, in terms of their accountability, they, they are accountable to uh, the government and the Irish Republic who established them. They are accountable to their board. Um, they are not accountable to me. And I have to say I do not have any particular desire for any element of NAMA to be accountable to me, given the headache that that would involve. Um, but I am, as a member, will be, I am um, sure, wanting to hear. Um, prepared to engage at any and all times on any and all issues with NAMA because of the importance that it does have for Northern Ireland. And, and, you know, it is holding uh, assets with a nominal value of around $3.5 billion, um, spread right across Northern Ireland, but primarily in Belfast here and in counties Antrim and Down. Um, they are assets that I would like to see out into the market at an appropriate moment because there are some very um, good properties that they have which could be developed out and, and, and benefit Northern Ireland's economy. But my biggest concern, and the one that I always will engage and my predecessor did likewise, is to ensure that in releasing those assets, which I think you know, we ultimately do want to see developed, that it isn't done in a way that would harm the property market in Northern Ireland in the way that I uh, talked to Mr McGuinness about earlier and spoke to Ms McGuinness about in terms of the way that, by contrast, RBS seem to be heading towards moving those assets on that they have very, very quickly, in contrast to what NAMA have said that they would do, and to be fair to them, have, have shown through their behaviour that they are taking a much more long-term approach to the assets that they have, and that's very encouraging. Jonathan Craig. Mr Craig. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that uh, detailed answer there. Um, would the Minister also give us an update <coughs> not only on NAMA's portfolio in Northern Ireland, but he would also outline what efforts the executive will make to actually encourage them to engage in some public projects which would be to the benefit of all of us. I thank the member for, for his question. In terms of the overall size of, of NAMA's Northern Ireland portfolio, it, it did have a nominal value of about $3.5 billion. Its acquisition value is, as I understand, $1.3 billion, which is, as, as the member will appreciate, a substantial holding in, in a Northern Ireland context. Um, we have some better information about their assets than we do about some of the bank's assets, and I understand that 18 per cent of what they have is office accommodation, 17 per cent is retail, 10 is residential, 5 development, 3 hotel and leisure. Uh, the balance is made up with a land at about a quarter of the portfolio, and 22 per cent is other investment assets. As I mentioned to the member opposite, um, 46 per cent of those assets are in Belfast and 80 per cent is located in counties Antrim and Down, with a balance elsewhere in Northern Ireland. In terms of encouraging NAMA to do some specific projects, they have, and this is again to be fair to them, they have, and I can think of, of two particular projects in different areas. One was um, moving forward with a residential project on the outskirts of Belfast at Dundonald, Millmount, where 95 properties are being developed, which will create 100 jobs in the construction stage, and the other significant one was the moving forward with Lanyon Plaza and the soloist in the centre of Belfast, which brings much needed uh, grade A office accommodation, which we can utilise for growth of existing companies or for attracting in foreign direct investment. Alwyn McGuinness. Mr McGuinness. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers. In relation to NAMA, NAMA has done some very good work, uh, particularly in the South and also in Britain, in terms of development. Um, and I know the Minister has referred to development at Dundonald and so forth, but 
did the Minister get any indication that NAMA would expand that work? Uh, uh, because it is very important that that investment takes place. Yes, uh, I thank the member for his third question on this uh, topic today. Um, yeah, I, I, have encur- I, I think I would encourage them, and I, would, I know will continue to encourage them to do so in a sensible and a, and a prudent way. Um, they have, interestingly, to follow on from, from what I said to Mr. Pig, they have lent around £140 million to businesses in Northern Ireland so they can add value to the assets that then they will ultimately realise value for in the longer term. So they have been, and they have, as we know, they have a lot of cash at their disposal, which they have employed elsewhere, and they are starting to employ here in Northern Ireland as well. I would encourage them to do that in a sensible and a, in a measured and a prudent way over the years to come. Order, members. I 